Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, had something come up last service, and uh, you know, most of the time, what you get in one service, you're not necessarily going to get in the next one. You don't want to try to produce anything, but it's kind of coming back up again. So I'm going to just, <clears throat> I'm going to just pray the same thing. I'm not going to lay hands on people for this. I'm not going to have you come up, step out. Um, but this just rolls up really strong uh, in the nine o'clock service that. Um, there, is, there was a person, but I've really sensed it was a number of people that um, probably nobody would know it because we're faith people. We're just re real good at walking by faith and not by our feelings, but so the feelings sometimes are still there. And it just seemed like there's a number of people and, and it just kind of comes back up in here. And, and uh, uh, that you, you, you're dealing with what I would call loneliness. There just It just seems like I mean, I, you know, you know, I know, we know that Jesus, he's the friend that sticks closer than the brother. I understand all that. But still, in the you can be in the middle of a mass of people and still have this loneliness that plays with your head. You know, you just, you just kind of feel like you're standing alone, you're fighting alone, you're, you're believing alone. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. It's that, that's really your business is between you and God. But I want to pray for you. I just have the same sense that there's just, and, and all that is, is, is again, it's, what it is, is the devil playing with people's minds. And it comes in the thought realm and it'll throw stuff at you. I want to pray for you right now. So I'm going to ask everybody just to bow your heads, close your eyes. And I'm going to pray if that's you, you just take this. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the authority that we have. The authority that you've allowed me to have in this house uh, for people in this place and even those watching live stream. Uh, I thank you, Father. That Jesus himself said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And when it goes beyond easy and light, it's not you. And uh, I have just a, a sense again, Lord, this service that there are those that are, are dealing with uh, their, their minds, their thoughts are being uh, subtly bombarded by things and they don't even realize it's, that's what it is. But it's just this, it's this um, almost, in some cases, almost a desperate, lonely feeling. And it's not by not having people around, it's something that just, it just plays with their mind. And so right now in the name of Jesus, I take authority over you, follow things that are playing with people's minds, harassing, trying to deter the people of God from their place. Yeah, you foul things. I take authority over you. I command you to cease and desist right now. You stop that. You stop that. Not in this house. You're not going to do that. Uh, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And I declare, Father, that everybody that that would pertain to is free today. And I thank you, Father. I don't really know how you do that. I know you, Jesus said you was anointed to heal the brokenhearted and Maybe that's a part of that. I don't know. But it's still the anointing that makes the difference. And Father, whatever it is that you do to take care of that, it's not necessarily bringing other people around. It's helping folks rise above that in their soul. And so I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for supernaturally working in the lives of anybody that pertains to and setting their mind free and their emotions free and therefore their will free. And it ch it'll change the very course of their lives. And I thank you for it. In the wonderful name of Jesus, I call it done, and the devils have to run. In Jesus' name. So the church can rise up, do your will, and have fun. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Somebody else, before we move on, somebody else, um, I, I, it seems like it's been there for a while, but it's been getting worse lately. It's actually from um, way up here in the upper part of the back of your head goes right down through your neck down through actually almost down to the almost down to the tailbone area um, it's just a, uh, and, and you just can't it just hasn't gone away I don't know if you've tried to have it adjusted or not I have no idea but your whole your whole back from here almost your entire spine it just has a dull ache to it it's not sharp pains but it just has a dull ache to it and uh, it's just it's there most all the time it's real hard for you to get comfortable if that's you just wave your hand at me is that you? Two, three. All right. Uh, uh, just raise your hand up. A again, if that's you, just raise your hand up. Okay. All right. You ready for another healing? All right. Okay. And I'm going to take authority over that in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And when I do, uh, I'm not telling you to do anything specific. I would just recommend you do something you couldn't do before without pain. 
because the pain's going to go. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I take authority over that, all the stress and strain on the bones and in the vertebrae and in the discs and, and the nerves that are pinched and, and from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. I command all the pain and discomfort to go. I command uh, freedom to flow through their spine even now, nerves to be released, pain to go. Pain, I take authority over you, and I command you to leave these bodies in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You don't have a will. You have to go. When we say go, I command you to go. Bodies be well. Redeemed, healed, whole, healthy. Redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Healed 2,000 years ago. I command you now to be healed. And be whole in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we ought to lift our hands and shout with them. <laughs> and uh, just start doing, start doing what you couldn't do before you got healed. Just start moving. Start, just start moving around. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The further you go, the more you do, the more the pain's going to leave and go far from you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If you can tell us any difference, just wave your hand at me. Some difference? Any difference? How are you doing back here? Good? 100%? No. About 70? Check it again. 80? It's gone. It's gone. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hallelujah. Praise God. And, and just one other thing. There's somebody that's, uh, 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 just a second, uh, lymph nodes, lymph glands, you, you've been noticing some symptoms. Uh, I don't know if it's been checked, diagnosed. I don't know. But something in the lymph glands, there's been an issue, a problem. You've noticed a change. I, I don't know if it would just be pain, if it would be swelling. I don't know. Don't know enough about medical science. I just know that there is an issue, something going on in the lymph glands in your body. And if that's you, um, in fact, if that's you, just hold your hand up. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, good. All right. Okay, enough's enough. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whatever has caused that, I curse it. I command it to cease and desist, disappear, dissipate, stop existing. I, com I command healing to flow in now. Supernatural healing to flow through their bodies, affect a healing and a cure from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. Lord, we could lay hands on them, but I have a sense we don't need to. There's a corporate presence here. And in the name of Jesus, whatever has caused the discomfort, the swelling, the pain, whatever it is, I command it to be gone and never come back. In Jesus' wonderful name, I declare it to be so on the authority of the word of Almighty God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's lift our hands and thank God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God. And if you can, if you can just check that where that situation, the symptoms were, if you can. If you, if you can tell the difference this quickly, just wave your hand at me. All right? Hallelujah. Say, well, what if nobody raises their hand? That doesn't make any difference. Hallelujah. Ten lepers were healed as they went. Sometimes you got to went before it shows up. Nobleman's son began to amend from that hour. So you may not be able to even tell right now, but you will. Hallelujah. How do you know? Because I know that I know that I know. Hallelujah. Because God's faithful. Praise God. Almighty God. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Jesus' wonderful name. Oh, there you go. No. All right. Hallelujah. Well, Father, we thank you. Thank you, Father, for your word that you magnified above your name. You forever settled it in heaven. And we trust you today for utterance, words to speak. And, Father, I thank you that these words, you'll take those and you'll confirm them in our lives. And I thank you, Father, that you're preparing us for what's out ahead. Good, bad, ugly. We don't care. It doesn't make any difference. It does not make a difference because there will always be a dividing line between Egypt and Goshen. There will be a difference, a dividing line between those that are yours and those that aren't. There will be a dividing line between those that walk with you and those that have chosen not to. There will always will be a difference. But, Father, I thank you that you're getting us ready for a bright cloud coming our way. The glory of God being made manifest. You're getting us ready for even darkness that may come upon the earth. You're getting the church ready so we'll rise and shine. We'll be salt. We'll be light. We'll be lighthouses. We'll flow in the power of God. 
and uh, we'll make a difference and put great dents in darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Well, go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> and if you'd open your Bibles to, uh, open your Bibles to, let's go to First Kings, the 16th chapter. First Kings chapter 16. And, uh, you know, as you know, I, I, I am a card-carrying member of the Optimist Club. Well, I don't have a card, but I should have. Okay, and don't get me a T-shirt. I'm, I'm not going to wear that to church either. But, but I'm not a doom and gloomer. Okay, um, I'm, but I, I am a realist, realist being real from the Bible, in that that we do know that you know there's there's stuff coming in the in the last days. Will be Paul wrote to Timothy, Second Timothy, third chapter, I think it is. Paul wrote to Timothy by the Holy Ghost and said the the, the last days would be. Uh, perilous times, dangerous times, difficult times. I don't think you have to listen to the news, read the newspaper, go out on the streets. I don't think you have to do much of anything to know that, you know, without being able to tell that things are changing out there. The world's getting a little weird. It's getting a little strange. Okay? That's why we're in it, but we're not of it. We're aliens. You believe in aliens? Absolutely. I am one. Okay. I'm from another world. I was from this one, then I got saved, and I came from another world. I, I'm a new creature in Christ, a new species of being that never before existed. Hallelujah. Now, don't take me out to, what do they call that, something 51, area 51. Don't, don't, don't try to commit me out there. I'm, I don't mean that. But, but um, no, it's, it's, you know, the, the world is not going to get better and better and better. We can read the scriptures and say the last days, uh, there'll be difficult times. Uh, men will, people will be lovers of self, and I'm not going to go back into that again, um, the selfies. Anyway, um, and uh, anyway, and it begins describing what humanity will look like in the last days, and if you look out at humanity, we're already pretty well into that, so we must be living at the last of the last days. But in the, in the middle of all that, there is a bright light, there is a salt, there is a light, there is the church, and no matter what takes place in the world system... Um, we're governed by different laws, okay? Now, I understand we have the laws of the land, but they're spiritual laws. We'll get into that another time. But um, no matter what comes along, we need to have a mentality that I don't want bad things for people. I don't want bad things to happen in the world. I don't, I don't like bad things going on, but it, no matter what comes along, it's not, going to, it's not going to affect my doing and being in the will of God. It's not going to make a difference in what I'm called to do on this earth, uh, and, and, and God, problems in the world do not change. Philippians 4, 19, that my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Doesn't, doesn't change uh, Galatians 3, 13, that Christ has already redeemed me from the curse of the law. Doesn't, doesn't change the fact that no weapon formed against me could prosper since God before me. Who can be against me? Doesn't change, nay, in all these things I'm more than a conqueror. Doesn't change, thanks be unto God who always causes me to triumph in Christ Jesus. As long as I walk in him, I'm in a good place. Okay? Okay, I'm not saying trouble won't come. I'm saying when it does, it's going to have a hard time getting past me and you. As I said, man, we ought to have a mentality when trouble shows up. I can be a normal pro Well, <laughs> I can be as normal as normal as I get, okay? I, you know, but when trouble shows up, I, I can be just walking, you know, uh, doing my, my daily duties and all that. But when trouble shows up, I can go into a spiritual phone booth and come back out with my red cape and my, and my big super sun on my shirt and come out and go and, and let the world know that there are sons of God on the earth. There are daughters of God on the earth. And we're going to walk like sons, talk like sons, think like sons, do the works of sons. All creation standing on its tiptoes waiting to see a real life son of God. They should, have, they should not have had to wait 2,000 years. There's been a few that have braved their way out there and come back and they've said, that, is, that promised land is just like it said. We've had the Smith Wigglesworths and the John Lakes and, and the uh, Amy Semple McPhersons and Marie Woodworth Edders. And we've had those folks that have bra braved their way out through corporate unbelief in the kingdom of God and come back and said, it's just like God said. And took a lot of heat for it until they were gone. Then people loved them. But at the same time, there ought to be in the last days, it won't be everybody because it's just not going to be everybody. You're always going to have your social church. You're going to have folks that just do it for social whatever. You're, they're always going to have that. But there's going to be a fervent church in the last days that is going to cross over into a spiritual promised land. 
yeah, well, that's heaven. No, that's not heaven. There's no giants in heaven to overcome. That's, that's a picture of the plan and will of God for the church on this earth. And there's a bunch of folks that are going to rise up and go, I'm going to do what he said I can do. I'm going to be what he said I can be. I'm going to have what he said I can have. I'm going to go where he said I can go. And there aren't enough devils in hell to even slow down my progress because I li- in him I live and I move and I have my being. All right? So, you know, you got me all sidetracked already. All right. Where was I? First Kings 16? All right, now let's look at, you know, so sometimes we need to understand if trouble comes, I need to know how to deal with it. You know, it, this is not time, this is not time to, to, to you know, d- dig a hole put our, in the sand, put our head in there and act like it's all going to go away. Or run out to the desert and hide in a cave, you know, get 10 years worth of dried food. Are you kidding me? When I got a marriage feast to go to, I'm not going to tribulate in the desert with dried food. Okay, but, but... At the same time, trouble may show up when it does. If anybody on earth ought to know what to do about it, it ought to be the church. Especially Bible-believing, tongue-talking, scripture-quoting, aisle-running, dancing the Holy Ghost, crazy, wild church. Somebody goes, well, I haven't gotten there yet. Hang around. All right, now. So um, let's take a look at a scenario back here. We can see in... uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, let's look at verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, and as I said, first service, I haven't got figured out if that's Omri or Omri. Um, depends on where you're from. Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel, and Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. Now verse 30. Let's, get a, let's see what the country looked like at this time. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Now, there's a reputation. How'd you like that? Okay. Say, what did you do on earth? I made God mad. What did, what, did, what did you do your whole time in office? I aggravated God. But it gets even stronger. Verse 33. Verse 32. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he built in Samaria. So now he's, he's building temples and putting little wooden gods in there. In verse 33, and Ahab made a wooden image... And Ahab, now look at this, verse 33, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger. You know, you don't want to make God angry. He did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Now, his reputation seems to be climbing. First, he aggravated God. Now, he's, got, he's done more to, to anger God than in all the kings before him. That's not a good reputation. Okay, so, and what you've got is the world operates on a trickle-down effect. What's at the top gets down at the bottom. What you have at the top, you have godlessness at the top, you're going to have godlessness down here. You have backslidden at the top, you have backslidden down here. It seems to have a trickle-down effect. That's just the way humanity operates. So because you've got this here, you've got the same thing in Israel. The nation's acting the same way. Okay, I mean, you get later on, we won't go into that this afternoon or this morning, excuse me, but we won't go into that, but, but, um, Later on, when, when, uh, uh, when Elijah called the pro- false prophets and prophets of Baal, but I think it was 750, 850 altogether, false prophets and prophets of Baal called them all, all together and said, uh, how long? and then Israel, had all Israel come there. And he said, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? In other words, how long are you going to stand with one foot and God, with God and the other foot with, with the devil? And how long are you going to walk with God on Sunday and live like the devil the other six days? How long are you going to act this way? If God's God, let him be God. If Baal's God, let him be God. But let's just find out which one can answer by fire. Yes. Yes. He, he's going to have a, I mean, this is okay corral. They're having a showdown here, okay? So, you know, but the bottom line is all of Israel... They'd walk with God one minute, and they'd backslide the next minute. So whatever's going at the top's coming down through. So the whole nation is in trouble. The nation's away from God, all right? They had a few good days here and there, but they're away from God, and uh, they have earned judgment, okay? They're just they're walking away from God. It doesn't make any difference. They're not coming back. They are not swinging this thing back around. They're just going to live the way they want to live, live after the flesh and so on. And so, so the nation's not a pretty sight. All right, now, I'm not predicting this kind of thing to happen in America. I'm just reading a story, all right? And so in the 17th chapter, verse 1, it says, I mean, right out of the clear blue, here comes the prophet's office. Oh, Jesus, give us a real flow of the prophet's office in the last days. We were listening to an to a audio clip from many years ago now of uh, some folks that walked in that office. 
And, uh, you know, I know some folks that walk in that office today. I've got a lot of friends that walk in that office. But I tell you, there's some things that operated back there a number of years ago. And I sit and listen to that, and I say, dear Jesus, where are those gifts today? They're coming. They're coming. You mark my... <laughs> oh. Anyway, it says, and Elijah the Tishbite, I love this, Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, who is this, who is this guy? We don't have his genealogy. We don't have his pedigree. We don't know where this guy came from. We don't know who his father, gra grandfather, great-grandfather. We, we can't go back four generations and see where he came from. It's just <laughs> Sid and Elijah the Tishbite. Who's Elijah the Tishbite? We don't know. But he just comes out of nowhere. And how does he get to stand before the most wicked king in the history of humanity? How does he get into the king's chamber? I don't know. But I'll tell you what, after reading about him, I wouldn't mess with him. And I'm not talking Ahab, I'm talking Elijah. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, must have stood right in front of him. And I love this. He didn't go up there and say, oh, most holy, wonderful king, kiss his ring, you know, bow down before him and say, oh, you know, you're just the greatest thing, said sliced bread, peanut butter on it. Man, oh, you're just wonderful. And you've made a couple mistakes, but after all, everybody, no. Mm -mm. This man has taken a nation and sidestepped it from the plan and will of God. Okay, I mean, they had to follow, but somebody had to lead. So it says, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand. There's the secret to it right there. Yeah. Before whom I... How do you stand before... <laughs> this Lord God of Israel lives before whom... How do you stand before the Lord God of Israel? How do you stand before the Lord God of the church? In prayer. In prayer. That's the only way you get to that place. So, as the Lord God of Israel, he's a man of prayer. You know, now we'll get to this another time, but I believe from studying, I believe that Elijah is a picture of the last generation of the church. A lot of things in there that we can see. We'll get to that another time. But he said, uh, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall, be no, there shall not be dew nor rain these years. What's that last part? Except at my word. Here's a guy walking before God, and, and, and God's using him in what we call the gift of special faith. That's the only way. You, know, you can't just go up to people and go, well, it's never going to be rain again. Yeah, okay, whatever. This guy stands before the most wicked king who would just love to kill him. He's been known to kill people before. He stands before King Ahab, and if, and if Ahab doesn't kill him, Jezebel sure will. Man, she made him look like a nice guy. Okay, so he stands up there and he said, As the Lord God lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years. This is not going to be a one-week drought, man. These years there shall not be dew nor rain. In other words, not only are you not going to have rain, you're not even going to have wet grass in the morning. No dew, no rain, but according to what? My word. In other words, I said it and it's going to take place and it's not going to change until I say it again. This is special faith in operation. When, spe yeah. when special faith operates... You know what God's going to do before he does it, and you know what you say is going to come to pass, not because of your faith, but because of a faith that comes out of heaven. Now, that's not our subject for this morning, but I'll tell you, special faith is an amazing gift when it comes in operation. So, and it doesn't matter who he said it to, he could have just said it in the back room, it would have worked, but he needed the king to know it. It's just, it's got to be said under the unction of the Holy Ghost. So, he, uh, he said, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, Ahab would just soon kill you as look at you. he's a bad guy. Okay, so you know when Elijah said that, it had to really aggravate him, and he probably would like to say, before he gets out the, the back door, just re, re, relieve him of his head, okay, just kill him. But he had enough respect for the things of God that he knew when this guy said it, the rain's going to stop, and it's not going to start again until he says it, and if I kill him, I will never get a good warm shower again the rest of my life. Because <laughs> if, he, if he dies before he says it, we are not going to, rain will have stopped permanently. So he understood that. All right. Now, what we're looking at is the nation's backslidden, they're away from God, the leadership's away from God, the nation's away from God, you got a whole mess in the nation, and now you've got a drought that started, and this thing's going to go three years and six months. This is a year, this three and a half year drought that's going to take place, and there will be neither dew nor rain. In fact, when Elijah did pray later on, you know, he went up on Mount Carmel and he began to pray, and he prayed and prayed and sent his servant out toward the sea seven times before he even saw a little cloud. So you'd have, imagine that three and a half years in a hot country without a cloud in the sky. No dew, no rain, no nothing. All right, so the nation's in a bad place. And so because of that, you're going to have, when you've got a drought that bad, there's going to be some lack of essentials like food and water. 
So here, you know, so now you've got, you've got the man of God that's obeyed God. And, and look what happens here. Verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Kareth, which flows into the Jordan. And it shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and he did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Kareth, which flows into the Jordan. And, verse 6, ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank of the brook. So isn't this interesting? First of all, you got all this trouble going in the nation and if Elijah is a picture of about the only one left that's serving God, isn't it interesting when the whole nation is in a drought with no water, no food, Elijah is getting steak and toast twice a day. That ought to tell you something about what God's able to do. Now he said, the word of the Lord came to him and said, go down, you know, told him how to get there. Go down by the brook Kareth that flows into the Jordan. Go down there and you're going to have water because of the brook. But go down there because I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Ravens are unclean birds, okay? But now notice what it says. So for best we can tell, uh, best we can tell, this particular facet lasted about two and a half years out of the three and a half. So for two and a half years, he's down by the brook. He's getting fresh drinking water. Every morning, a raven comes and drops off steak and toast. Amen. Every evening, a, a raven comes and, and drops off steak and toast again, okay? Now think about that. I, okay, just daydream with me for a minute. I can't prove it. You can't disprove it. Just let me have my fun out here. So imagine this. You've got, you've got who, who in a nation that's in the three and a half year drought, who is going to have two and a half years into it, who's going to have steak and toast twice a day? Probably Ahab, probably the king, all right? So I, I just got this picture. I can just see him going out on his veranda in the morning. And he sits down and they bring his, you know, they bring his steak and his toast. And he's going to have, you know, he's going to have breakfast. And here comes this raven. <laughs> comes down there and gets a steak in one claw and gets the toast in the other. And he flies off. And here's Elijah sitting down by the brook at the table with a plate in front of him and a fork and a knife going, Thank you, Lord, for the food that's about to be set before me. And here comes that raven down there, drops off. A filet mignon and a piece of toast. And he goes, thank you, Father. Glory to God. And then he comes back. He sits down 6 o'clock in the evening. Here comes the bird again. I'll bet. Now, I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Ahab didn't tell his cooks, every time you fix me a meal, fix two. Because <laughs> my hunters are not as good as they need to be with a slingshot. And then nobody's able to take out this crazy, unclean bird. And that thing is stealing my meal every time I come out here. And I don't know where he's going with it. <laughs> So anyway, so you've got supernatural provision. All right? Supernatural provision there. But look at this, okay? There's a, there's a, a key in here. If, if Elijah's going to have supernatural provision in his life, then the church will have the same thing. Right. Not a bit concerned about it. Well, what are we going to do if this happens? What are we going to do if that happens? We are going to be supernaturally provided for and taken care of. But isn't it interesting, he didn't just say, well, go out and find the nicest place you can find to stay. Just, you know, go anywhere you want. I'll take care of you. Let's read that again. All right? He says right here, verse 4, or excuse me, back, uh, verse 3. Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Kareth, which flows into the Jordan, and it will be that you shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you. There's another word in there. There. He could have gone to any brook. There were probably a lot of brooks at that time. They hadn't dried up yet. He could, have gone to, he could have gone to the Red Sea. He could have gone to the Dead Sea. He could have gone to Tahiti. He could have gone to the Pacific. He could have gone to the Atlantic. He could have gone anywhere he wanted to go. But God had told the ravens to take the food there. there. So it doesn't matter the fact that God had promised to provision for him. The provision was based on his obedience. If you're willing and obedience, obedience you what? Obedience. Eat the good of the land. Obedience is better than sacrifice. It wasn't just a carte blanche, do what you want, go where you want, act how you want, and I'll take care of you. There is a qualification in here because God's always honoring obedience. Okay? Now, we're not going to base this on one scripture. We're going to follow through with some things um, because I think a lot of times we, we, we wonder maybe why things aren't working the way they should, and maybe we're spiritually AWOL from the will of God. Now, I know none of you ever would be, 
But I, it's, it's, it's real easy to think, well, I don't know why this isn't working. I've got Bible. I've got verses. I'm, I've quoted the word 4,000 times since 9 o'clock this morning, and, and it's just not coming through. Now, I'm not making fun of quoting the word. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But sometimes we're doing everything but d- dwelling in the secret place of the Most High God, which is the leading of the Holy Ghost. Someone goes, well, I just don't know, how to, I don't know how to hear from God. I don't know how to be led. Well, we've got some good books out there that will help you. It's called The Guide Inside. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and, and so, now notice here, he, he said, I've commanded, that, that's a key word, I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. there. That's a key word in there. Now, if you notice, you go to the next verse, it says, and because of the lack of rain, the brook dried up. And so we get to verse 8, it says, and the word of the Lord came to him again, saying, rise, go to Zarephath. God didn't just say, oh, I'll just go find a better place. I'll take, I'll take care of you. Do what you want. Go where you want. I'll take care of you. God always has a plan. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell where? There. Everybody, all of us have a there in our lives. There is what God's dealt with us to do. Well, I just don't not hear from God. Sure you do. Sure you do. You're sitting here, aren't you? That's living proof. Okay? There, he said, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a... A widow, where? There. Luke, the fourth chapter, said there were a lot of widows in Israel in the time of Elijah. Elijah. There were a lot lot of widows. There were a lot of starving widows. There were a lot of them that were going to starve to death. But somehow, for some reason, some way, somehow, I don't know, we don't know, for some reason, God singled out this one widow and said, I've commanded her to sustain you. Don't you love that? Elijah could have gone, oh, Lord, please. Don't you have some like really rich people that have like freezers in the garage filled with fresh meat and you send me to a widow that's probably going to starve to death anyway and why did God send him to the widow woman? Because she had some needs too and he knew everything got initiated by giving, okay? He wanted to, he wanted to save her life. Other people are going to make it anyway. Other people, if they had all kinds of stuff, that'd be great, except that then the prophet could attribute his being, making it through the last year of the drought to the fact that he found a rich guy that had plenty of stuff to take care of him. When God sent him to a widow woman in Zarephath, and and I love the fact she didn't even know it was her. He didn't walk up and find her, and she goes, oh, yes, the Lord spoke to me. I'm supposed to sustain you. He walked up and said, get me some water, okay, and while you're at it, get me some bread. I don't have bread. I'm gathering sticks. I got a little oil. I got a little meal. I'm going to make a little cake. We're going to bake it. My son and I are going to split it, and then we're going to starve to death and die. God's woman of faith and power right there. (laughs) She's not looking. Isn't it interesting? You know, sometimes you're an answer to prayer, and you don't even know it. Most of the time when God has called you to be something in somebody's life, it's a divine secret. Sometimes you have no idea. Sometimes you don't know. Uh, we talked, actually talked about it Wednesday night when Pastor Janet and I were in, in uh, Pensacola this last week. We were going to meet uh, Pastor Eddie Turner and his wife for lunch. And um, going downstairs at the hotel, coming down the hall, or just walking down the hall, heading for the elevator, and, and here's the part of the housekeeping crew. There's a, a lady that's cleaning a room. There's, a, there's a, a younger man, younger's relative, a younger man, got a cart full of towels and sheets and all that, and he's standing there, and uh, Pastor Janet, she just, you know, just does the typical high thing, only what we do, you know, we usually ask a question, but we really aren't looking for an answer. <laughs> she goes, hey, how y'all doing? And you're expecting, you're expecting either nothing or good, you know, whatever. She goes, hey, how y'all doing? He goes, terrible. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> well, there's a door you can drive a truck through right there, all right? But see, but we're, we've got lunch plans. We've got plans there. We're, we're right on time to get down to get to our lunch plans. Okay, but here's a fellow with his eternity at stake. Make a long story short, we got to talk to him for a good while. And uh, the part I want to get to is... He was from one of the islands off the coast of Honduras. That's where he's from. And um, had a wife, and I think he said two or three kids. And he he said, yeah, he said, uh, said, well, I'm not really an alcoholic. I can quit any time I want. I said, ooh, there you go. No, of course you're not. You can quit any time. It's just if you take a drink, you can't stop. Okay, is that right? He goes, yeah. I said, you're an alcoholic. All right. So so we talked to him for a number of minutes and, and, uh, and said, can we pray for you? 
The lady who cleaned the rooms, man, she disappeared, boy. I'll tell you what, she buzzed into a room. I said, do you know Jesus? She said, no, and she ran into a room. God's got her number, though. You can run, but you can't hide. So anyway, we're just talking with him. We said, can we pray for you? He said, yes. And then he stopped. We prayed for him. And uh, he stopped and he said, I, I used to be saved. I said, really? Okay. And uh, he said, yeah. He said, he, said, uh, he said, I used to be able to quote John 3.16 in three languages. I said, really? And so finally we said, uh, he said, here's, the, here's what we're looking for. He said, he said, yeah, he said, my grandmother used to watch Christian TV and right up until she died. She watched Christian TV all the time. I thought, aha, aha. We're not, just, we're not just sharing with a guy. We're an answer to a prayer. Grandma prayed before she left. And was it TJ? TJ was his name. And TJ's, he's just running from God, drinking his way out there. And all of a sudden, here comes a couple of crazy preachers down the hall going, hey, how you doing? And without thinking, he goes, terrible, I'm an alcoholic. There is light at the end of the tunnel. God can fix your life, man. I, don't, I know a lot of people that have been dry for years. And you can be the next one. So anyway, but what I'm saying is, we didn't know. We didn't, we didn't have God say, I have called you to go be an answer to grandma's prayers. He didn't say that. We're just walking along going, hey, how y'all doing? You know, and sometimes you're an answer and you don't even know it. So anyway, keep moving here. So we got the same thing. The brook dries up. That's not the end of it. Oh, you know, they're good. things are going bad at work. What am I going to do? The brook dries up, but God has another plan. Don't ever let it throw you off. You know, well, they're laying people off. They're probably going to lay me off. Well, if they do, then somebody else is going to lay you on. Somebody else gonna, with a better pay and better benefits. Do not let that bother you. God already saw it coming. He didn't do it, but he saw it coming. And when the brook dries up, God's got a better pond. Man, he went from drinking out of a brook and getting food from a dirty bird to going in and having home-cooked meals for the next 12 months. Okay? But it was, it, the thing is, food was going to show up at the brook. Food was going to show up at the widow's house. And it was up to the prophet whether he's going to be there or not. The miracle was there. And his choice was, am I going to be there? Or am I going to be AWOL from there? Am I going to decide I got a better place? I got a better plan? Besides that, I just, you know, I don't like, I don't like the cake she's baking. You know, it's like, you know, I think I'll, go, think I'll go down to the neighborhood bakery and see if they'll feed me. No, the miracle was there. But again, have we got any more examples of this besides physical sustenance? Um, you can go over to 2 Kings, the fifth chapter, and here's this uh, really important guy named Naaman. Okay? Very important. He's a Syrian soldier. Uh, he's, a, he's got great favor with his king. You know, he's an important guy. He's a rich guy. He's a wealthy guy. He's got everything money could buy. He's been a conqueror out there taking cities and so on. The only problem is the Bible says, but he was a leper. Man, you know, you can have all the stuff the world can offer. You can still have leprosy clinging to your life. Stuff that's eating you up. You can have all the riches, all the wealth, all the stuff. But if you don't have a walk with God... Man, that leprosy will cling to you. But thank God there's this, you know, boy, if people just realize, boy, I tell you what, I can be a witness. I don't have to be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, all the above, all at once. I don't have to do all that. I can be a witness where I am. I can let my light shine in the darkest places. Here's this little maiden that is a slave to Naaman's, to sister Naaman. Probably not sister, probably just Mrs. Okay, got no covenant with God. She's been brought out of Israel. She's a slave free labor for, for uh, Mrs. Naaman, and in the middle of it, she, you know, Mr. Naaman, he's, he's got leprosy, and she's, I just love this, she goes, would God, he were in Samaria and could get to the prophet who would heal him of his leprosy. Boy, wouldn't it be wonderful if God could get some bold folks like that today? Yeah, I'd do that if I thought it'd work somewhere. We need to get some confidence in the power of God again. But, she says, and so, Word got from Mrs. Naaman to Mr. Naaman. Mr. Naaman talked to the king, and the king wrote a letter and sent Naaman to the, to, uh, uh, the king of Israel and went over there, sent a letter and said, I've sent my servant over here so you could cure him of his leprosy. Now the king's really upset. He's going, he's trying to pick a fight with me. He's trying to start war. He sends a guy and asks me to heal him of his leprosy. Right. How am I going to do that? Do you think I'm God or something? And here comes the word from the prophet. He said, ah, oh, he said, don't get all upset about it. He said, send him to me and he'll know there's a prophet in the land. 
<laughs> so here comes Naaman. He's an important guy. Everybody should treat him with royalty. He should have special treatment because he's really important. He's really rich and he's really important. <laughs> he pulls up to Elijah, Elisha's front door and Elisha doesn't even come out and greet him. He just, he's kicked back in his easy chair. You know, he's reading his Bible and praying. And he tells the servant, go out and talk to him. The servant comes out. Now, Naaman's really aggravated. Where's my honor? What does this guy do? He's sending his, he's sending his servant to come help me? I mean, what's the deal here? Don't, does he not know who I am? Yeah, he did. That's why he sent his servant. So the servant goes out there and he says, well, he said, uh, Elisha just said, go down to Jordan and dip seven times and you'll come again clean. Made him so mad. First of all, he's expecting Elijah to come out and clap his hands over where the leprosy is and, you know, and, and do some special doodad thing, you know, to make him better and, and, and all that and honor him and bow at his feet and all that. He doesn't even come out. He sends his servant out there and the servant says, go to Jordan. Now he's really mad because he says, the Bible said he was wroth. That's King James really mad. He was wroth and said he, he, he was wroth. And he said, are not our bad and far, far rivers of Damascus far greater than this dirty Jordan? You want me to, he was mad. He's going, he's going home. He is really aggravated. He's taking his leprosy and going home. And finally, one of his servants said, master, if he'd have said do something difficult, you'd have done it. Why not say when he says wash and be clean, why not do that? So he went down to the Jordan. Number one, he could have gone to Arban and Farpar and stayed with his leprosy. It wasn't, it wasn't that the Jordan was a healing river. If it was a healing river, people would be coming from all over the world. It wasn't that. It was obedience. And then, think, what if, he'd have, what if he'd have come up out of the water the sixth time and said, this is ridiculous, this stuff does not work, I'm going home. What if he'd have stopped at six instead of going with seven? Because the seventh time up out of the water, he came out clean. It's obe See, God's not wanting to just give us rules and regulations. It's just obedience always releases the power of God. Yes. Place called there. The brook Cherith was there. The widow woman at Srepta was there. The Jordan River was there. How about John the ninth chapter? The man that was born blind, Jesus put mud in his eyes and said, go wash in what? The pool of Siloam and you'll come again seeing. He could have gone to a lot of pools. Could have gone to the pool of Bethesda. I don't know. Could have gone to a lot of places. But his miracle was there. His miracle was there. It was in the pool of Siloam, and he went and dipped, and he came again seeing. Legend tells us he got two brand new eyeballs. We don't know. Won't know until we get over there. But you see the same thing. And, and I mean, we, we could just go on and on like this. But I look back, and, and uh, you know, my life has consisted of where it worked. My life has consisted of being there. I, and I didn't understand what that was. I didn't really understand what that meant. But it's all through the scriptures. Um, you know, I mean, I, I got, got my life right with God. I walked an aisle in November 1972, gave my life to Jesus, came back, finished another year of college, went home, worked in the real estate business for a while, knew I needed to go somewhere. I needed something. I didn't know what it was. And so I, uh, I, I it was either December or January. It was a record cold. I was in Michigan, which is bad enough. But I went to see a friend of mine. He was, he, he was in uh, Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. Now, nothing, don't misunderstand me. Nothing wrong with Moody. It's just what's there for me. What's my there? My there is different than somebody else's there. This friend of mine was going to Moody, and he said, come over here. You need, you need a school. Come over and spend a you know, couple days with me. I'll take you around the campus. And I was all ready to enroll in Moody. Moody Bible Institute. Great school. Produced a lot of great fruit. But, our, but he took me in their bookstore, the last thing, and he said, this is our bookstore. I said, wow, this is great. He said, if you'll notice, he said, we don't let any of that tongue-talking stuff in our, book, in our bookstore because we don't allow it in our college. I thought, ooh, this is not going to work. This is not there because I talk in tongues every day, and then this is not going to work. And so, so I packed up, went back home. So I booked another trip in the summertime. Summertime in Oklahoma. Summertime. I'm from Michigan. My car didn't even have AC in it. I drive down here. On the way down here, I stop at uh, Evangel College in Springfield, Pentecostal Bible School. Maybe that's it. I pulled up in the parking lot in front of it. I knew that wasn't it. Okay? I drive on down here. I'm persuaded I'm supposed to go to ORU. Most amazing school, wonderful school, incredible school. Was, is, always will be. Amazing place. I thought that's got to be it. It's the only other kind of full gospel school I know of. I go to ORU. It's in July in 1974. 
I was glad I was going to heaven because I'd never been anyplace that hot in my life. I'm walking across <laughs> campus and it's got to be. It's 105 if it's anything. And I'm staying with a friend of mine, his apartment, the AC's broken in the apartment. I spend, I'm in the pool till, you know, neck deep every day. I'm just sitting there, just, just thinking, oh, I'm glad I'm going to heaven. But, but I go up into ORU, I go up in the prayer tower, they let me go up there, and I've driven 900 miles to get down here, and I knelt down there and began to pray, and I'm praying in the Holy Ghost. I finally said, Lord, this is where you want me to go to school, isn't it? Almost audibly, I heard one word, no. I said, God, could you not have told me that? 900 miles ago? He could have. I just didn't think to ask. I was sure that was it. As great as the school's word that I went to, it wasn't there for me. And later on, long story, very short, later on, I found out about a man named Reverend Kenneth E. Hagen. He's almost 60 years old, and he was starting a brand new school that year in uh, September of 1974. And um, and I, and, and I knew that I knew that I knew that's where I needed to go. I mean, it wasn't like 5,800 students or 58,000 students. It was 58 students. Charter class in there. I don't know who the man is. I don't know what he teaches. I don't know anything about anything. I just know I've never felt in my heart like I do when I show up at this place. This is there for me. And suddenly, I had an understanding. It took me a while to get it. But I suddenly realized the reason the other places didn't work was for me. This is not everybody. For me. This is my there. For me, God wasn't sending me to a school. He's sending me to a mentor. For me, that's what it was. And I had a 30-year mentor before he checked out and went to heaven. I had a 30-year mentor. So that was my there. If I'd have gone anywhere else, I don't even like to think of where I would be today if I'd have stopped anywhere else other than my there. So, finish this up in a minute here. So, I, uh, uh, so I finished school uh, a year later, I moved to Colorado. I'm there for 13 months, about 12 months into it. I'm praying one Wednesday evening. It's a prayer service. I'm praying. And, 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 and I'm in Colorado, and I love it. I want to be a youth pastor the rest of my life. I love Colorado. I love working with youth. I love, this is wonderful. Jesus, I found my call in life. I'm praying. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost says, uh, gave me a specific date about a month and a half down the road. So gave me a date. Said, on such and such a date, pack up, move back to Tulsa. And get your old job back. So, well, Lord, why would I get my old job back? I mean, that's my old job. Why go backwards? God would never have you go backwards, would he? Sure he will. Sometimes he'll get you backwards to get you forwards. That's how a slingshot works. But I didn't know it at the time. But I didn't care. I just wanted to be there. So I moved back to Tulsa, got my old job back. I'm doing what I did before I ever went to be a youth pastor. I'm doing exactly that. And I'm back in Tulsa. Then, then uh, within the next year, I have a chance to go to Africa. First overseas trip. Go to Kenya, go to South Africa. Got to South Africa, fell in love with South Africa. I loved South Africa. I loved, it was a wonderful place. I got to preach all over South Africa. And, and I had a wonderful time down there. Okay, so I'm going to unpack and live in South Africa. I am going to be a missionary to South Africa. I'm going to follow the footsteps of John G. Lake. I am going to South Africa. I'm, go I'm not going back. It's okay until I prayed. And the Holy Ghost said, go back home. I haven't called you to do this. Go back home. I want to, I want to, but God, I want to stay. Why did he keep, why did he keep sending me back to Tulsa? Because I was believing God for a good wife. And this is where she was. <laughs> this was there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isn't that right? Right, right? Hallelujah. I'm so glad I came back. Yes. Obedient. Thank you. Okay, so then, you know, 79, we get married, we start to travel, and, and, and uh, we, at one point, we, we got invited, somebody invited us to come be an associate pastor at a new church in Oklahoma City. Man, we're going to go do it. I don't know why we thought about doing that. I don't know why we, we, to this day, we don't know why we thought about doing that. God moved in a supernatural way to tell us not to do that. That wasn't there. We went to Australia two times in Australia, two times down there. I had the telephone in my hand to call back home and have somebody pack all of our stuff and ship it to Australia. We were moving to Australia. We did our best to move to Australia. It was okay until I said, Lord, this is what you want us to do, isn't it? And both times, no. He doesn't give you a sentence. He just gives you a word. No. Well, if this is not it, then what's it? Silence. But we, we, you know, we, we tried to move to Oklahoma City. We tried to move to, to, to 
Australia. We've, we've tried to move a number of different places just to try to obey God, not trying to get out of the will of God. And then when God dealt with us about a church, we drove to Dallas two times. I was determined we weren't going to do it in Tulsa. We were going somewhere else. We were going to <laughs> Dallas. <laughs> And every time we'd, get to, we'd hit the Tulsa city limits and the presence of God would just lift off of us. And it's like, okay, doc, you're on your own. I'm going, God, I don't want to be on my own. I don't like this feeling. We'd come back into Tulsa, hit the city limits, and the anointing would be back. So why Australia, Oklahoma City, Dallas, why? Because there's a move of God coming to Tulsa. It's in the works, and we're going to have our feet right in the middle of this thing. And God wanted World Outreach Church to be in Tulsa for his divine purpose, for whatever that might be. And all I can say is, through life, the most important decisions we've ever had to make are what's there. I don't want to be a wall from the plan of God. It doesn't mean he's going to get mad at me and slap me. What it means is provision, protection, everything. It's there and it's up to me if I want to be there or somewhere else. And if things aren't working the way things ought to work, my first question for me is going to be, am I there? Everybody's got it there, and it's a different place, not even a physical location. It's just something in the will of God. What is it God's been... St Everybody's got something. God stirs us about being somewhere, doing something. And best thing to do is make sure I'm doing what he's asked me to do because obedience is better than sacrifice. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, let's stand to our feet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I thank you that there is a place called there for every one of us. We all got to find our there. But when we find it, we ought to stick with it until you tell us something else. Now, Father, I ask you to speak to hearts if there's anyone here that's never made Jesus Lord of their life, never been born again, never been saved, or they have been. But they've been away, they've, they've been AWOL. They've gotten away from the things of God. They've gotten lukewarm and their life's not where it should be. The joy is gone. The fellowship with you is gone. Things just aren't where they ought to be. Father, if there's anybody in here in that situation, stir their hearts, love on them, let them know. All they gotta do is make a decision. Put one foot back in the will of God and if they'll just do that much, you'll meet them there and you'll change the course of their life. I thank you for that. So if that's you, if you're here and you'd say, Pastor, I, I need to get some things right. I'm, it, it, I, things are not right between God and me. If Jesus returned today, I wouldn't be ready to meet him. If I died today, I'm not comfortable with where I'd go. I don't know. I'm just, and besides that, I should be having heaven on earth, and it's just not that way. Things are not the way they should be. I'm, I'm away from God. There's a sadness in my heart. There's a, a void in my heart that only the presence of God can fill in. If that's you, wave your hand at me. I want to pray for you. Anybody here say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to get some things right today. Okay? There's one hand over there. Okay, good. Thank you. Anybody else say, pray for me. I've got to get some things right. Anybody else? Never a better time than today. Why wait? Why spend one more, uh, one more day away from God when you could be with, I mean, running with him, hanging out with him? Anybody else? Anybody else? There's somebody else you're just struggling. Do I, should I or shouldn't I? Should I or shouldn't I? If you're struggling with that, just jump in with the rest of us. It seems there's somebody else. Just wave your hand at me. All right. All right. If you'd look up here at me, um, if you raised your hand, even if you didn't, but you should have, I'm going to ask you to just come join me down here in the front. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I want to pray for you. I want to make sure if you raised your hand, I want, to, I want to make sure that you got what you raised your hand for. Hallelujah. <laughs> Good. I know sometimes that can feel like a long walk, but I'm sure glad I did it 40, whoa, 40 some years ago. You ready for a change? Ready for a miracle? Today's the day, huh? Turn, go a different direction. Is that right? What's your name? Danny. Danny? All right, Danny. Appreciate you. I know that's a long walk. I know it's getting one foot in front of the other. I understand. That's the hard part. Now comes the easy part. All right? Everybody reach your hands out toward Danny. Father, I thank you for this man's hungry man. And what he is seeking, he will find. What he's looking for, he'll locate today. I thank you, Father, when he leaves this building today, everything's going to be changing. It's not that he'll never have another problem. It's just that he's always going to know he's got an answer. Thank you. His walk with you is going to be like something he never dreamed possible. Thank you, Father, for...
taking charge with him of his life. I pray he'll never be the same in the name of Jesus. I pray he'll, he'll have a, a hunger to read his Bible and a hunger to talk to you and spend time praying with you. And, and I thank you that after today, he's always going to know of, beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that Sunday, November 1st, 2015, he made a change. And, and it was settled for eternity. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Amen. Now I could lead you into prayer, and that'd be really easy and really good, but I want to make sure that you got what you came for. I want to make sure you get your questions answered, and it won't take long. It's just a short thing, but if you'd follow this gentleman right behind you here, that's Matt. If you'd follow him, he's just going to share a couple of verses and make sure that you clearly got what you came for. God bless you. Appreciate you. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Now let's lift our hands and thank God for meeting him in that prayer room. May he never be the same. Thank you, Father, for ministering to Danny. I pray that when he leaves here, and make him, make him a, a shining light to a lot of lives. May the difference in his life from his decision today, may it, may it be very obvious to a lot of people. We ask you for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. If everybody just turn toward the camera back there, we've got people watching all the time. We have people all the time that, that watch, and, and uh, we want to give them an opportunity. If, you're, if you are watching online, if you're watching live streaming, watching on television, and maybe that's you, you say, my life just isn't what it ought to be. It's not right. Things aren't right between God and me. I've, maybe I've never been saved. I've never made Jesus Lord in my life. Maybe I've done that, and I've, I've slidden away, and my life isn't right, and, and you're just ready to come back. It's just a step. You don't have to work your way back in. God's waiting for you with arms wide open. If that's you, I want you just to pray this prayer with me. I'm, we're all going to pray the same prayer together along with you that are watching. Just pray this after me. Oh, God, I come to you in Jesus' name. I want to be saved. I want to walk in fellowship with you. I make Jesus Lord of my life. Jesus, come into my heart. Make me a brand new person. Give me a fresh start. I thank you for doing it. I call you my Lord. I'm now saved. I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. Jesus, I'll spend eternity with you. God, you are my Father. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'm going to suggest that if that was you, find a good church. Find one that preaches the new birth. Find a place. If you're in the Tulsa area and you don't have a church, come visit us at World Outreach Church. It's a place you can call home. But either way, find a good church. Get a hold of a Bible. Read in the New Testament. Start reading. Don't try to read the whole thing. Just read a little bit every day and spend time talking to God. You don't have to get religious about it. Just talk to Him. He wants to take care of you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. Glory to God. If you would be seated just for a moment, <laughs> well, actually a couple moments, just to give you a, a real brief update, um, uh, Pastor Janet and I went to, you know, I just love divine connections. I, I, I enjoy the way the Holy Ghost works. Um, Pastor Janet and I went in April, I believe it was, to um, um, a minister's conference. We went to a church and a minister's conference in Switzerland. And uh, in this minister's conference, we used to do one every year there, and, and we've had, we worked with ministers, pastors all over Europe for, oh, about 20 years. And then, but it's been about 20 years, close to 20 years since we've done much over there. Well, we're in this minister's conference in, in uh, Switzerland, and a friend of ours from Munich, Germany, uh, we used to go to his church two, three, sometimes four times a year. Um, he and his wife had, had a, you know, a good, really good church in Munich, and uh, uh, he drove over about a four-hour drive. He drove over to the meetings in the middle of the service one night. Look out and here. He comes walking in. And uh, so we got time to fellowship that evening and the next day before he had to drive back. But uh, long story short, um, we talked after the service, uh, I think it was that second night. And he said, he said, remember, he said in, in uh, uh, would have been 85, 1985, he said, you came to, to, to Munich and we had the fir our first annual faith conference really the first one we know of in Germany. Not that there weren't more, it was just the first one we knew of. And uh, he said, we had, remember that? And I said, well, of course I remember that. And we went every year. I mean, their, their faith conference, they, they got to where they'd have, oh, in, I think it was usually in August, they'd have 3,000 people. They'd have to rent a big auditorium. They'd have 3,000 people in there. Um, healings and miracles. And we had some amazing meetings over there. 
and did that for a number of years. And um, he said, you remember the faith conferences we did? I said, yeah. He said, well, he said, there's a whole new generation. He said, I just realized the other day, he said, this year is the 30-year reunion of the faith conference. It's been 30 years. Now, he hasn't done them for years. He said, but I'm stirred. He said, there's a new generation coming up in Europe. And he said, they, they're, they're hungry, they're fervent. There's the, the great praise and worship. But he said, but there's very little word. And he said, we've got to be able to get the word of God into this next generation where they can mix the word and the spirit. And uh, there's a generation coming up. And he said, I want to do, an, do a homecoming, a 30-year anniversary of the faith conference. And he said, I want to know if, if you and, and, and Janet would come help us. I said, I don't have to pray about that. Just tell me when. He said, it's going to be the first part of November. I said, perfect. We'll book it in. So uh, we leave tomorrow morning, and we, we'll be back the, the 13th, so a week from Friday. We're going to go over. We've got Wednesday, Thursday. I'm sorry. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, four days of meetings in Munich, Germany. Um, and uh, I just, one of these things, it's, it's there. I just know that I know. We know that we know. It's just, now, you know, what it's going to be, I don't know. You know, I mean, my goodness, it's, we haven't been there in 25 years. We hadn't seen this pastor friend of ours in, I think it was 20 or 25 years. So it's kind of stepping back into an old, new world at the same time. I don't know anything except I know it's God. I just know for us it's there. And so we're really excited about going, you know. And um, that goes through uh, Saturday. And so we were just planning to do that and, you know, maybe even come home Saturday night and be in here, you know, wondering what planet we're on by Sunday morning. We got to praying about it. And God began to stir our hearts a whole different way. And, and he really dealt with us that we're not done over there, that he's sending us on an assignment. Okay? And so when we finish Germany, we're going to two other European cities. Not, not to vacation, not to sightsee. I'm the world's worst sightseer. I tell you, I've had more invitations to go sightseeing. I said, please, please, don't do that to me. I don't like, I like food. I don't like sightseeing. And... Uh, Bless my lovely wife's heart. She's put up with that for years. But now, but God dealt with us that we're going to, we, we haven't even told anybody where we're going because we are not going to fellowship with friends that we have in those places. We're not going to visit. We're, we're going to pray. All we know to do is go check into a hotel and spend two days praying, waiting on God. Why? I don't know. What's going to take place? I don't know. What, do you, what report are you going to get when you get back? All I know is we're going to come back and say, mission accomplished, whatever it was. And so, um, so we head out Monday. We come back uh, Friday, the, the 13th of uh, November, coming back in from, from Europe. And we will be in three cities. We'll do the conference in Germany. We're going to go then to two other cities for two days each and um, covering a lot of territory. And, um, and we would love to have our, our family here hold the ropes for us. And so I'm going to ask you to, in a moment to, just to pray for us. Um, but... Yeah, yeah, of course. The question would be, well, you know, what about us back home? And that's a legitimate question. You know, I, I, I make a commitment to you that we're going to obey God when God deals with us to go. If you were in Dr. Mark Barkley's meeting here a few years back, he spoke by the Spirit of God and clarified some things about the fact that because of the call that's on our life, uh, the nature of it, there are going to be times where it, we don't go just because we're bored here. We go because uh, on assignment. And when there's an assignment, all I know is if we obey God with that, then God takes care of the house back here. And so we, we commit to you that we're never going to go obey God without holding God to the fact that he will, he will send in his best for that season into the church here. And so uh, what I want to do is just let you know uh, what's going to be taking place the next 12 days. Um, so we're going to have, uh, actually, first of all, I, and it's funny, I just, I got stirred with, uh, just about a week ago. I don't know why it takes so long sometimes, but I didn't get my stirring until about a week ago. And then, um, so this coming Wednesday, uh, Brother Greg Fritz is going to be coming in to minister, into the Wednesday night service. But I talked to him the other day, and I said, you know, I mean, the man can preach. There's no question about that. Teach, preach, prophesy, pray, do whatever. But he's a man of prayer. And I got a stirring that the two Wednesdays that we are gone to have, not prayer meetings. You know, prayer meetings can get really dull. You can run in, get on your knees, pray in tongues for 30 minutes, wake yourself up, pray another five, and then go home. That's just, you know. It, prayer services should not be dry and boring. They ought to be so full of life. And so uh, I asked Brother Greg, I said, would you come in, in, and I don't normally direct where people go. 
So I don't know what he's going to teach or preach or anything else other than that. I said, but I do really want to have a prayer service. So somewhere in the service, I want us, I want, I want us to pray. Okay? So he's going to be doing that. And then uh, I think I saw Dexter Sullivan. Did I? Would you just stand up and wave, would you please? Brother Dexter Sullivan, um, he's an itinerant. He travels. And uh, he's in the church a lot of time. But when he's not, he's out traveling somewhere. He's all going all over the country. But I also, in praying about it, I got really stirred to contact him and say, would you take the Sunday the 11th, I'm sorry, Wednesday the, Wednesday the 11th, Wednesday the 11th, and come and do a prayer service? And that's his forte. I can, I, that I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt. He, he's a, he's a, a praying machine, and, but can just bring a prayer presence in. And so I know sometimes people think, I can, you know, I can hear it. I can hear the wheels turning, prayer. I think that's a good time to stay home, prayer. No, trust me, you're going to want to make sure you're here. Because a real prayer service is something where you go in one way and you come out another way. And so, uh, so uh, Brother Dexter is going to, he's going to minister on Wednesday the uh, 11th. And both Wednesdays are going to be prayer services. <clears throat> um, you're not going to have a move of God in other areas until you have a move of God in prayer. Okay? And so... What about Sunday? Um, Sunday, I, I, when we first started making plans to go to Munich, knew we'd be gone over Sunday. And I mean, right out of the clear blue, we, we've spent years going overseas to go minister for people. We've gone all over the world to go do a meeting for somebody. We've, we've gone overseas to do a service for people. I mean, one service, imagine that. Fly eight or 10 hours, fly back. We've done that. That's just what you do. But I've never thought about having somebody do that for us, okay? Until just recently. And I'm telling you, I got so stirred about what to do for that Sunday. I don't know what that means. I don't know what direction it's going to go. You know, I don't want to produce a, uh, an expectation that's way beyond, you know, uh, outside the boundaries of the universe or something. But I just know I've heard from God. And so we're going to have... Um, for Sunday, the next Sunday, which is the 8th, um, that uh, uh, Josh and Hannah Adams are flying in from Brazil to do the service for us. Now, I've never done that before. I've never flown a missionary in on a missionary trip. But they're coming in. And in case you don't know who they are, let's just go ahead and play that clip for a minute. Just, just so you remember, if you've been around here for a couple months, you should remember this. I want to do something here before I uh, get into the Word tonight. You know, I, I, I really enjoy have, seeing all the, the uh, displays out there. What do you call those? What you, the expo expo uh, of all the different ministries. And, but there's a couple in Brazil, Joshua and Hannah Adams. This couple just packed up and moved to Brazil. Just went. And... Uh, I, 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 I'm just impressed with that. They're, they're young people. Where are you? Are you here tonight? Hopefully you're here tonight. Just packed up and went to Brazil. I mean, just left. Went to, went to Brazil and God's using them and they need more space and it would only cost 50K. 44, 45, 46, 47, <laughs> 48, 48, 49, 50, 51. Hallelujah. Woo. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Lord, you've sent them into the world to fulfill a call. And Lord, I release my faith with them right now for super.